Welcome to the Penguin Podcast. In this edition, David Bedil talks to the actor, broadcaster and writer Stephen Fry about his new novel Mythos. As this is a retelling of the Greek myths, there is occasional talk of the violent actions of the gods. There is also some mild but good-natured language. Hello and welcome to the Penguin Podcast. I'm David Badil, and in this episode we're talking about gods, specifically Greek ones. And the writer I'm talking about them with is a man, yes, but a man possessed of such a wide variety of talents, displayed at such a high level, he may be the nearest we have to a modern god. Although I should assure you, he's not sitting here naked apart from a flimsy toga. It is Stephen Fry. Hello Stephen, how are you? Very well, thank you, David. And Stephen has brought along a number of objects that have influenced his life and his writing. Uh, let's talk about the castration of Uranus. Now let's get on to hey. that. Let's get, uh, let's get on, <laughs> on to that in a minute. Although I do want to talk about the extreme hardcore mm. behaviour of these gods. But let's, let's get mm. on to that via just telling me why you are so interested in Greek gods. Always have been, David. It's quite hard to know, but it was like a sort of prepubescent equivalent of falling in love. I had a book called, you know, Favourite Greek Myths of Ancient Greece or something, and mm. they spoke to me in a very profound way, in the way that other folk tales, fairy tales... I had other books, tales from Russia and from, um, you know, other parts of the world, and they were charming stories. Somehow myths... I don't know, there is no real difference worth, you know, going to war about in terms of what a myth and a folk story and a legend is. You know, we all have our sense of the difference, but something about the mythic world was so complete, so detailed, so pleasing. In the book, I'm very keen not to try and explain myth. This is not about mythography. It's not, you know, I'm not being Joseph Campbell or, mm. or you know, James Fraser or anything like no, that. It's a retelling. It's a retelling. Like many people in my generation grew up with the two volumes of Robert Graves' uh, mm. compendious uh, collection of the myths. And, you know, the names of those heroes, Bellerophon and Achilles and, uh, and and of the gods, Athena and Hermes and so on, they, they just stayed with me. And What age were you when you first encountered I guess them? about 10, probably, something like that. In what mm-hmm. form, then? In, in a book called Favourite Stories from in ancient Greece, I think, right. something along that. Well, then was I, that given to you by your parents? Yeah, I think it would have been, yes, exactly. It might even have been my father's when he was a boy. It, right. It was in the house. Yeah. Know? And then, you know, when you have a sort of, you know, for some people it may be, you know, German aircraft of the Second World mm. War, but when you have a pet subject, yes. and then you watch something like University Challenge or, yeah. or, or Mastermind, and a question comes up, in Greek mythology, and my ears would prick up, and it yeah. was as if, it's like when someone you love has crossed the street in front of you, you know, your heart leaps up. It's a very, you belong to that yeah, subject, so, and it belongs to you. And yes. you, it's it's personal. Yes, and well, the identity of uh, when you're young, you're all about creating precisely. your identity. And so your identity at that point was a fanboy of Zeus. That's and exactly Greek how we put it in general. Now. Precisely. Right. I see. So you didn't find it difficult at all because obviously one imagines you were a clever 10 year old well, but at the I same mean, time it is quite a, uh, it's a lot of information it is and in that sense i suppose for some people who are very interested in fantasy the legendarium as i believe it's called of tolkien mm. is full of names that i don't really know because i mean yeah. it's not something that's ever particularly spoken to me but you know they'll know all the details and games of thrones fans know all the what the seven kingdoms or five kingdoms however many kingdoms there are in games of thrones they'll probably know them and it's part of the pleasure in the same way at that age, you collect information about football teams and, mm. and Messerschmitt 109Es or whatever it is. So that was part of the pleasure. One of the things that saddens me, and I hope this book will at least for some people solve, is that because it's Greek and because we associate Greek with the classical world mm. and because we have phrases like a classical education mm. and because Greek in, is reserved in the English language for uh, intellectual, mm. medical and scientific things. So we talk about, you know, catheters and uh, metathesis and things. It seems like an intellectual pursuit. Mm. And actually Greek myth isn't the least bit intellectual. Mm. It's passionate and human-shaped and, and remarkably exciting and sexy and, and, and full of, you know, all the aspects of what it is to be human because the gods, if you wanted to say so, kind of represent every facet and in later periods we've still stick to them as models I mean right up to famously of course Nietzsche who divided you know, a lot of the human being into the Apollonian and the Dionysiac if you like there are intellectual moments in the book obviously mm. and there's quite a lot of incredibly interesting stuff about the le- how the lexicon of yeah. Greek mythology continues to this day but an awful mm. lot of it is a very playful retelling mm. of old stories my children in fact are probably too old for this point I'm going to make when they were 10 and there's definitely large bits of it I could read because it has an element of fairy tale to it, of course. But what interests me to some extent, and whether uh, this was perhaps what got you into it, 
is they're very decadent fairy tales. They're very amoral fairy yes. tales. I mean, obviously yes. some fairy tale is like that, but a lot of fairy tales are not as hardcore as, as this. And I wonder if that interested you. It did, for two reasons. One, because I think it's... Um it's sparky and brave and typical of the Greeks that they, in the way that they love nudity mm, uh, yeah. so much, you know, after all, a gymnasium means a place to be naked. Gumnos is the Greek for nude. And their gods and their heroes were nude on their vases. You know, the emotions were naked. They didn't clothe the indecent side of humanity, as yes. it were, including same-sex love, famously, of course, fluid gender, and all these things are very much part of it. And the Greek myths I read when I was a boy tended to be more bowdlerized. But I was interested in the Greek myths as they were and the fact that they are naughty and the, the naughtiness of them. Shocking, come out, I And say. shocking. In I many mean, places. I didn't know, because to bring my daughter up again, my daughter did classics briefly mm. at her school, was very interested in it. But then I was thinking of her when I read up that Kronos castrated Uranus, yeah. and that's a key moment in the creation of the world, and his yeah. genitals, sort of like a, a stone that you might skim across the ocean, yeah. they skim across the ocean, his genitals, yeah. semenizing the world, as it were, as yeah. they go, with, with blood and seam and whatever. Yeah. And I'm reading this, thinking a little bit about my 12-year-old daughter reading yeah. this in class, and I wonder how that was for you. And, and I think what's so interesting about this is, you know, such a violent act, a son castrating his own father, you might say is a symbolic thing, mm. Freud would talk about that as a pretty obvious kind of uh, thing. But but what's so interesting in the Greek myths is, yes, he, he castrates his father and th hurls his genitalia across the sea and they skip and bounce along there, trailing, the, you know, the, like great ropes of semen. Mm. And where they stop and they fizz in the water, the froth comes, and out of the froth is born, well, you would imagine something ghastly, some hideous monster. But no, out of it is born one of the most famous images in all of Western art, Botticelli's great birth of Venus, because mm. it's Aphrodite, mm. as the Greeks called Venus. Mm coming up, you know, this beautiful, soft, demure, lovely goddess of love and beauty. And in a scallop shell, we picture her. Um, she arrives on the beach of Cyprus and with birds and butterflies and singing around her. And it's a moment of enormous beauty born out of that violence. Well, that's one of the things about it, which yeah. uh, in a sort of post in a Christian universe is very interesting about the Greek gods, yeah. which is that there's this amoral or lack of an obvious moral map yes. to everything they do, because everything yes. they do is petulant or selfish or yes. essentially human. Yep. in some way, but also it can include great beauty or it can include great violence. There doesn't seem I to think, be that yeah. obvious moral narrative which we assume the divine to be infused. Exactly. I think the Greeks were much more empirical about that. They looked at the world and they said, well, you know, I'm not they said, and they didn't sort of organise things by committee. We're talking about collective unconscious, mm. I guess. But, but they, you know, they said the world is magisterial but cruel, capricious, violent, stormy, inconsistent. So if there are gods, they must be beautiful, cruel, unjust, inconsistent, whimsical, capricious, and so on. And so the gods reflect every aspect of the world that the Greeks experienced. Mm. And some of it is intensely beautiful and mm. wise and brilliant and creative and extraordinary. Mm. But some of it is just monstrously unkind and unfair, really. Yeah, I mean, we should probably leave it to later on, but I've wanted to just you bring it up now. What it also is, is extraordinarily pedantic. Yes. For example, <laughs> in the story of Tithonus, is that correct? Yes. Tithonus is... Eos's yeah. lover, yes, and she's a goddess, mm. and she wants for him immortality. She pleads mm. with Zeus for immortality. Zeus gives him immortality, yeah. and then she's forgotten to mention she would like that immortality to include eternal youth. Yes. So he just grows older and older and older and never dies. Exactly. And what I love is that Zeus is kind of yeah, you didn't mention it. Yeah, Hard your luck. fault. You said immortal. He's immortal. Yeah. You didn't add. Can he stay young? Yeah. And so he becomes so withered and dried up and hideous that she that she manages to take him into a cicada. Or, is there a lot of comedy to that, upper. wouldn't you say? Yes, there is, very much so. Let's hear from Mythos with an extract from the audiobook read by yourself, starting at the very beginning. These days, the origin of the universe is explained by proposing a Big Bang, a single event that instantly brought into being all the matter from which everything and everyone are made. The ancient Greeks had a different idea. They said that it all started not with a bang, but with chaos. Was chaos a god, a divine being, or simply a, a state of nothingness? Or was chaos, just as we would use the word today, a kind of terrible mess, like a teenager's bedroom, only worse? Think of chaos, perhaps, as a kind of grand cosmic yawn. And as in a yawning chasm or a yawning void. 
Whether chaos brought life and substance out of nothing, or whether chaos yawned life up or dreamed it up or conjured it up in some other way, I don't know. I wasn't there. Nor were you. And yet, in a way, we were, because all the bits that make us were there. It is enough to say that the Greeks thought it was chaos, who, with a massive heave or a great shrug or hiccup, vomit or cough, began the long chain of creation. That was Stephen Fry reading there from the audiobook of Mythos. It's a very interesting extract because, of course, the idea of chaos, as you point out in the extract, feels very modern, doesn't mm. it? It feels very Brian Cox. Yes. Admittedly, you're correct that our modern idea is that there was not chaos at that point. There was nothingness. Yeah. But nothingness and chaos feel very similar. They do. And in fact, the Greek sense of chaos is closer to an abyss, a, a yawning, as I describe it, a kind of opening, a, rather than a chaotic jumble. Like, it's a kind of waiting. It's, mm. it's, it's a sort of pause. And I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, idea of infinite regress, you mm. know, this, uh, this idea that uh, the children, very intelligent, will say, you know, why does this happen? You explain. They go, well, why does that happen? Why, why? And the why can go back, can regress infinitely, and, of course, you can never satisfactorily mm. suggest it. And similarly, you talk about, well, there was the the, the Big Bang. Well, what was before the Big Bang? You see, how, how do you say that? Well, my, my answer is to say, well, you can't say before because before is a time word, yeah. and there was no time. Yes. So you can't have before time. The way physicists explain it is it's turtles all the way down. Do you, do you know that story? I the, don't think uh, I know the turtles. The, 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 there, was, there was... Um, Let's say it was Stephen Hawking. I mean, we, Stephen Hawking, we, we, we don't know who it, who it was exactly, but some uh, physicist was, was giving a talk and this woman said, yes, that's all very well. Uh, it's an interesting theory, but it's no more than that. As a matter of fact, the world is supported by a turtle. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> and so Stephen Hawking said, but yeah, but who's who, who supports the, the turtle? There's another turtle under that. Well, what turtle is under that one? So well, you think you're a very clever, young man, but I assure you, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> and and that is that is the thing physicists say to to explain the problem of infinite regress. You know, is that it's not something we can sort of helpfully encompass. But you find a start point, and you imagine that time starts then too. It raises another point, I think, about writing a book about gods and the, particularly the playful way you've written it, which, of course, you're an atheist, I'm mm. an atheist, and I love the way in this book you will say, and that's why this bird still has that exactly yes. that, that colour of, of plumage yes, or whatever. Yes, the chaffinch is pink yes. because it blushed. Yes, you yes. completely <laughs> deny evolution throughout this <laughs> book course. and say yes. it's all because of these legends that we have, yes. the natural world yes, that we the, have now. What, yes, what is known in the fancy word is etiological myth, you know, the cause of things. Or you might call the just-so stories is another way of putting it, isn't it? How the elephant got its trunk, and yeah. how the chaffinch got a pink breast. Or, or indeed the fact that when we shout into a, a yawning chasm, we hear words back to us. Because as far as, as, far as you're nymph. concerned, that's because Echo yes. is condemned by, I can't remember, Aphrodite? <laughs> Aphrodite, yes. Aphrodite to always say back the last words. That's a hilarious <laughs> bit, by the way, the way you write yeah. that bit, where it does feel like Echo is actually having conversations <laughs> yes. because you've written it very carefully. Oh, well, I'm it's glad it's you kind of simultaneously that. very high level and very childish, which yes, I, really, I really like. But it's an interesting thing because at some level, I, I read it a tiny bit as a satire on religion mm. that you could interpret ultimate belief mm. in that this is how we came to be, which yeah. the book at some level uh, strikes the ironic pose as believing yeah. in, as a satire on religious belief. Well, yes, it is. I mean, I have no quarrel with people who have religious belief. I just don't happen to share it, and I'm not interested in trying to humiliate pious and devout people. And I am slightly, but carry but, on. Yeah, some people are, I know, and I disagree with some of them, what are known as the new atheists. Mm. But partly because I enjoy liturgy. I enjoy yeah. metaphor so much that the metaphor of even the church, like the Catholic Church or the Anglican Church, although we can all talk about what harm it may have done the world and uh, how it seems nonsensical and rationally, empirically, and in any other mm. way, I love ceremony and ritual, the, yes. you know, the, the dramatised versions of metaphor. I love the liturgy. I love the, I love hymns. I love psalms. I love, I love cathedrals. Oh, I completely agree, really. Um, I do completely agree that you don't know what it means to be human if you're not prepared to give religion the time of day. Absolutely. I would, it's nice I would completely agree fun things to investigate. It's and, poetry and magic. Yeah. It's just wrong. That's the, that's the, yeah, it's, it's factually not to be, wrong. It doesn't represent objective truth. No. But then the point about myth is, is I think that most of the time that we're humans... Objective truth is the glass of water in front of us, which is fine, but what's going on inside us is really what, how we define ourselves and our day and our relationships and indeed our relationships with our country. And all these things are, are not objective truths. Britain is not an objective truth. It's, an, it's a myth. It's an idea. One of the things that defines you, I think, is language. And mm. you've brought along, normally on this podcast, people bring along objects that in some way illustrate or symbolise mm. their life. 
You haven't actually brought along anything that I could see, but I think you've brought along some words. Is yes, that I, I have. One of the words I brought along is magnet, and that's because it has a nice connection with Greek mythology. You talked about how Kronos is uh, th- through Uranus's junk across the sea. (laughs) And it was a pattern that was to repeat itself because Cronus himself married his sister Rhea, who was a fellow titaness, and Uranus had cursed him after he'd sliced off his genitals and said, you will suffer from your children Mm. as I have suffered from you. So he impregnated his sister Rhea. Each time she had a baby, he swallowed it. Yes. And eventually she got sort of so fed up with this um, that that, that she (laughs) hatched a plan and she found a beautiful piece of stone from an area of Greece called Magnesia. And it was a piece of what we would call Mm. magnetite. Mm named after Magnesia, and she wrapped it in swaddling clothes and pretended to be giving birth, and Kronos came and saw, swallowed it, and then she went off to Crete and had the actual baby, mm. who was Zeus. Mm. And Zeus came back and indeed you know, destroyed and made him vomit up the other children who were Poseidon and Demeter and mm. uh, Hades and, uh, and so and So that, this is how so, we get the word magnet. And it's how we get the word magnet from this magnetite, and also the word uh, magnesium and magnesia, mm. as in milk of magnesia and various yeah. other things, and also through a, a kind of metathetic accident or mistake, if you're spelling mistake, if you want to put it that way, manganese. So it's just interesting how so many words in Greek come out, you know, like yeah. that. One of the things about reading the book is the persistence of those words, if you follow it through, feels an enormous persistence of myth. So yes. Europe, I didn't know this, yes. Europe comes from, I believe, Europa, yeah. who is, I can't remember what she's a nymph, is she a nymph? No, she's <laughs> a daughter of the king of Tyre. Uh, in, in the <laughs> yeah. Middle East, in fact, what became the Phoenician Empire, and her brother Cadmos went off to search for her because she yes. saw this bull got on its back and it, the bull was Zeus. Yes, she, but she rides the bull yeah. and it flies the bull yeah. across what we now would consider Exactly, to be from Asia Minor, from Tyre, over into Europe, which yeah. is named after her. Exactly. So that's extraordinary in a way. Yeah. A word that you so take for granted. And because she crossed over at the point where Turkey and Greece meet, it's called the bull crossing, the Bosphorus. Right. And as I point out, it's strange to think that the Bosphorus and Oxford have exactly the same meaning. Yes. That is. Oxford, Bosphor. <laughs> it's it's, yeah, it's a very strange thought, isn't it? But it's extraordinary <laughs> that, that in normal conversation, yeah. indeed now when people are on very dull programmes are arguing about Europe, yes. that somewhere in there there is this extraordinary piece of magic. Yes, Nilus was a child uh, who, who became the River Nile and uh, uh, Egyptus and, and Libya was uh, a, a person uh, and, uh, and, and Asia was uh, uh, Climene, the, the, the titaness was called Asia. And so a lot of the words we use in our geography and elsewhere, and Greek for bear is Arctos, so they just called the land where the bears, the white bears Rome, the Arctic. If you know all this, it enlivens, I think, what could be very dull, ordinary conversation. <laughs> if you feel that those words live as they, as they do exactly with that history. Exactly right, exactly. Let's hear a little bit more from the audiobook of Mythos. Here, a young Zeus is about to fulfil his destiny and seek revenge on his father, Kronos. Midnight. The thick cloth that Erebus and Nyx threw across earth, sea and sky to mark the end of Hemera's and Ether's diurnal round, blacked the world. In a valley, high up on Mount Othris, the Lord of All paced alone, banging his chest, restless and miserable. Kronos had grown into the most foul-tempered and discontented titan of all. Power over everything gave him no satisfaction. Since Rhea had, without explanation, banned him from the conjugal bed, sleep had been a stranger to him too. Denied its healing balm, his mood and digestion, neither good at the best of times, had worsened. The last of the babies he had swallowed seemed to have provoked a sharp acid reflux that the previous five had not. Where was the joy in omnipotence when his stomach griped and his thoughts stumbled blindly in the thick fog of insomnia? That was Stephen Fry reading from the audiobook of Mythos. You don't do much in the way of deconstructing no. what might be the deeper human unconscious reasons for these myths. But what I think the book very much does indicate is the power of story. Yeah. That, as far as I know, and you could probably tell me that there were many stories before this, but this feel to me like the Ur 
as in you are, stories, mm. that mm. these are the, the first attempts to take the mess of life and create a pattern out of them. That's and right. the way they do that is through things about how we create it. How do we begin? Where do we, you know, what genesis leads us yeah. to where? What relationship we have with the elements that uh, shape us, the trembling of the earth, the volcanoes, the things we can't control, the seasons and so on, and who operates them, are they operated? And yeah, what, and know. they're cracking stories. Yeah, I mean, they are. And, like, and one of the things I think was, is interesting in terms of what we were talking earlier about the fact that these are very human gods is a lot of them are based on curses and revenge mm. and things like that. Like the blacksmith guy. Hephaestus, yeah, yes. Hephaestus' revenge on Hera yeah. is a very interesting example of story because Hephaestus is thrown out for being a bit ugly, but he turns out to be very good at making things. Yeah. And so he makes for Hera, his mother, yeah, a, throne, he, a, yeah. throne, a golden throne yeah. that then captures her but when she right. sits on it, comes alive and she can't get out of it. Yeah. Now, I'm interested in that in terms of narrative because what we have there is the idea of revenge, mm. which presumably you know, is something that the Greeks understood that they sometimes felt vengeful, yeah. but they're creating into it a thing whereby one thing has consequence and leads to another, and yeah. then you get an end point, which is somehow satisfying to Absolutely read about and hear about. right. Yes, that's so true. And it's rather touching in the case of Hephaestus because he traps his mother in this enchanted throne and he's the only one who's able to free her, mm. but, but his revenge for being cast down from Olympus as a baby and you know bouncing off the mountainside, which gave him a limp for the rest of his life. But... His revenge was that, but he's happy to release her, and it's his calling card to be allowed back. And he becomes the blacksmith god, the god of vol yes. volcanoes. That actually is a remarkable yeah. human moment it is, isn't in it? the story. The fact that Hephaestus does, it, does this, then lets her go, then she yeah. says, OK, yeah. you're clearly I'm, you're, one of us. Yeah. So You've come back. your place. Yeah, normally, at that yeah. point, someone gets turned into a tree yes, or something. Exactly. <laughs> That's normally exactly. the end of it, yeah. Right. A lot of people get yeah. turned into trees. They, they do. The Roman poet Ovid, of course, was fascinated by all the myths in which people are transformed and he wrote a you know collection of uh, marvelous uh, mm. stories and poems about it called metamorphosis mm. these transformations yes and and um there yes they, they obviously narcissus is the most famous flower one but there was hyacinth and crocus the the, the daffodils you know became well, a narcissus laurel. is a very interesting one as well because i didn't know until i read it mm. in your book that narcissus and echo are so linked mm. that mm. echo falls in love with narcissus yeah. and narcissus is meanwhile having his moment when he's yeah. falling in love with himself not realizing it's himself yeah. and what's interesting me about that is there's a structural thing going on there whether conscious or unconscious which is these are the two self-reflexive yes characters in this That's tapestry right. the most self-reflexive yeah. and yet and they're somehow linked and it's quite hard to piece exactly why that is but it feels yeah. very correct narratively yes exactly it's it, it's it's not a straight allegory that you can no. it doesn't it's a substitute like algebra but it is nonetheless it's very very resonant in the mind it makes you think resonant is exactly yeah. right it leads it's got an abstract mm. power that isn't breakable down yeah. Into this is what this means in I the way that more simple fairy tales exactly. might be. Exactly, and I think that's why Greek myth, more than any other uh, that I know, is so popular with painters and mm. sculptors because it suggests rather than states. Mm. It's not a full allegory. Mm. There are many paintings right up to, you know, famously um, of Narcissus, the, the, the pre-Raphaelites in Waterhouse and Dali, uh, a fantastic painting of the, uh, the metamorphosis of Narcissus. Yeah, a painter isn't interested in something that's just a dull, straight piece of, you know, information, if you like. They want to suggest something. You know, mm. they, they want to paint the, the problem or the, the space between the events you know, to keep it alive. Of course, you could also argue that the nudity and the naughtiness, the debauchery and so on, the, the transgression of Greek myth was also perfect for Renaissance artists because they could only paint either religious subjects where mm. obviously they couldn't enjoy much human flesh, mm. apart from the old San Sebastian, perhaps, or something. Mm. In the case of Greek myth, they were free to show human flesh and all its wicked. Let's have another object stroke word uh, that you've brought along for us. Well, um, it's a bunch of grapes. Okay. The last god to be created, the only of the Olympian deities to have a, a mortal mother, Semele, was Dionysus. Zeus had a, an affair with her and it got very confusing, but Hera deceived her into making Zeus reveal himself to her in his actual form. Oh, yes. Well, there's a marvellous word for it, a theophany, yes. <laughs> yeah. manifestation of self. Yes. And she it blinded her and blasted her apart. And, and so Zeus took the uh, the fetus of this child that he'd implanted in her and opened up his thigh and... <laughs> 
put the, the the embryo in his thigh and stitched it back up again and used his thigh as a womb. Yeah, that turned so out to be okay. It turned out fine. And the child, the child was called Dionysus, and yeah. Dionysus to be kept out of Hera's way because he was a jealous, uh, you know, the, of, of Zeus's affairs. Uh, he fell in love with a boy called Ampelos, who was a beautiful youth in the way that a lot of Greeks fell in love with beautiful youths, including Zeus himself, with Ganymede, of course. Zeus was pansexual as well. Yes, indeed, very much so. And Ampelos and Dionysus were very happy young men together. And Ampelos was a, you know, a rather frolicsome and perhaps rather proud youth. And he was riding a bull, a lot of bulls in Greek mm. myth. And uh, he called up, he laughingly to the moon, Selene, the moon goddess, and said, look, I can ride this horned bull better than you ride the horned moon across the sky. And never challenge a god like that. So she sent down a gadfly to madden the bull who tossed and trampled and gored Ampelos. And Dionysus came in time to see the boy dying and he cradled him in his arms and he transformed him into a plant, as we've spoken about, something they like to do. Mm. And the blood sort of the, became blisters of this beautiful fruit and the plant was the vine. Mm. Uh, Ampelos is to this day the Greek word for vine and the, the blood was turned into grapes. And he transformed this into wine. We know this from, from an interesting poem called the Dionysica by a poet called Nonus, who was also a commentator on the Gospels. Mm. So it's interesting that he was writing about this myth of this transformation of love into wine. Every so often when I was reading your book, myths that I vaguely knew about before, but you were explaining in a, in a way that brought them home to me better than I've, mm. I've sort of uh, had them before, I thought, well, how much of this is pre-Christian? I mean, Prometheus, for example... Mm. I knew about Prometheus before that he created fire for humans and mm. Zeus got pissed off about mm, that punished and, him. and punished him by sticking him to a wall or a cliff yeah. rather. Now what that struck me when I read it is how that feels like Jesus because yes. he's he's created something for humans. Mm. He's done something which he knows, you know, is going to lead to his own sacrifice yeah. Yeah. and he's done it as far as I can make out from your reading of it, mm. in great humility and with great yeah. passion and, and he's trying he's to... He's our friend, yes. Yeah, for humans... I mean, he's Jesus, isn't he? There's an element of that. What's interesting is that he was a pivotal hero to the romantics, like particularly Shelley, of course, who mm. wrote Prometheus Unbound. And yeah. the, Shelley was expelled from Oxford for his atheism, uh, and it, he was a radical. And it, for him, it was incredibly important to see that if you wanted to interpret the world, if you wanted to set man free in that romantic way, then you did it by setting him free of the idea of a, of a god and a Christ to whom we owed anything, any allegiance to whom we should apologise. Prometheus instead was an alternative, if it were, because Prometheus gave us equality from the, with the I gods. See. He stole fire, which was both the fire that allowed us to smelt and cook and bake and uh, and raise ourselves above animals to frighten predators and to control the world and the, the substances in the world, but also divine fire. Mm. It was the kind of, you know, we were equal with the gods, which is why Zeus was so furious. He couldn't bear the idea that mankind was as good as gods. We're going to hear a bit more from Mythos from the audiobook. In this bit, Zeus punishes the defeated Titans. Zeus now moved to make sure the defeated titans could never rise again to threaten his order. His strongest and most violent opponent in the war had not been Kronos, but Atlas, the brutally powerful eldest son of Iapetus and Clymene. Atlas's brother, Menoetius, whose name means doomed might, had been a furiously powerful and terrible opponent too, but Zeus had destroyed him with one of the very first thunderbolts. Atlas had been at the centre of every battle, rousing his fellow titans into combat, shouting for one last supreme effort, even as the Hecatonchires were battering them into submission. As punishment for his enmity, Zeus sentenced him to hold up the sky for eternity. This killed two birds with one stone. Zeus's predecessors, Kronos and Uranos, had been forced to waste much of their energy in separating heaven from earth. At a stroke, Zeus relieved himself of that draining burden and placed it, quite literally, on the shoulders of his most dangerous enemy. 
Tell me about the audiobook. How do you feel reading this stuff? I love it. As it happens, I, I have a sort of side kind of uh, occupation in which I I do audiobooks anyway. Oh, right. I, 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 I did, um, for example, the Harry Potter books. As, as, as of course they came, you did. As they came out. Uh, and modern is, legends and modern um, gods. If you like, yeah. yes, absolutely. A very full legendarium, yes. definitely. And that was fun. And I just finished last year the um, 72 hours of the entire... Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes canon. So from the very first story, his study in Scarlet, all the way up to the last story in, in, in his last collection of short stories. And, and so I enjoy audiobooks. I, I've always loved telling stories, yeah. whether they're my own but, or something else. That else's. comes across very strongly yeah. in this book, your love of story. It, it's very strong. I, I, I'm still a child in that sense. I adore great stories, and it's what I look for still in books and films. Well, in writing this book and indeed in reading the autobook, audiobook, did you find yourself taken back to when you first oh, had that yes. book when you were 10? And... Absolutely, and, and even more so because, uh, you know, knowing more about the world this way or that, um, you see more connections with things that you hadn't known were there. Um, and and, and the, the sort of whole um, structure and complexity and detail of the Greek mythic world becomes even more remarkable to do, me. Do you go to Greece a lot? I, do, I and love it. When you do go to Greece, when you're at the temple in Athens, mm. do you do you feel, uh, you know, goose pimples on your flesh at the idea I, that I this ha this sort of happened here? I'm obviously it didn't actually happen, but it's, you know, yeah. it's sort I do, of particularly did. Delphi. I, I find that a remarkable place still. It's beautiful and it's very well kept. The Greek government and T tourist board and all the other people responsible do, do a marvellous job at keeping it there. And you can you can see where the oracle was, you know. That it has a famous, you know, um, entablature which had the great gnote seafton written on it, which is the, if you like, the motto of the Greek world, know thyself. A remarkably profound and interesting mm. thing for a civilization to have as its motto, you know. You mentioned something in Epidaurus in the book. Now, I've been to Epidaurus. Yes, you've probably I've, been to the theatre, which saw, is I saw miraculous. Sam Mendes' The Winter's Tale ah, there you are. Uh, well, you'll, Epidaurus. You'll know is, about his miraculous acoustic. And yes, the, it's a the, fantastic the, the place. Fabulous. Yeah. But it also, there's an Asclepion there, which is a name given to basically <laughs> what you might call the equivalent of the very fashionable spas that mm. every hotel now tries to boast and get you to spend ludicrous sums of money being pummeled and so on and seaweeded. And, and the Greeks like to do that. Asclepius was, was, um, was a son of Apollo, and Corona is a, a princess whom Apollo had an affair with and it, it all went rather bad and mm. he had to slit her open and take the baby out. It often goes bad, doesn't it? <laughs> the often baby, goes wrong. The baby yeah. was brought up by Chiron, the, the famous uh, yeah. centaur, yeah. Uh, and he became uh, the most marvellous doctor, the first doctor. He actually achieved divine status. He married a woman called Hygienia. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's, 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 imagine their family and they, their daughter Panacea. You, know, you, always, you imagine this family. Yeah. Diagnosis. Yeah. Stop playing yes. around. And their son Paracetamol. <laughs> exactly. All of that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But he became the you know the great the medical god. He's the staff of Asclepius with a snake twined round it. Is used in ambulances and all over the place. Although that's got a dark moment in it, hasn't it? Because at one point Thanatos or someone in the underworld, Hades, possibly. I, I just remember reading mm. your books. Gets upset because the doctor. What's his name? Hygieia. Uh, no, Asclepius. Asclepius, yeah. the doctor has created medicine essentially, yeah. which means the underworld is suddenly pissed off yes. because it's less populated by dead souls Hades than is, it should be. Hades which is, is a brilliant bit of Greek thinking. I absolutely, think. Hades is obsessed with productivity. He yeah. wants a lot of throughput. Of, yes, he exactly. wants a volume of souls, and, uh, and the idea of them being held back and being or dead people being brought back to life in some cases maddened him. And so Asclepius was deeply punished, but he came back and uh, uh, and then became a god. And anyway, his temples, the Asclepions, were these spas and. and there's a marvellous one in Epidaurus, or Epidaurus, as uh, they like to call it in Greece. And you can see the priests there who wore white, just like spa attendants now. You can see the records and the, the treatments they gave the, the patients. The patients came, paid quite a bit of money, stayed the night uh, very often. They were encouraged to have dreams in which, with any luck, Asclepius would come. The more money they paid, the more likely they were to have him. And right. they were given all kinds, and there was music played and so on, and there was mindfulness was attended to as much as bodyfulness. Wow, really? Wax was there. Yeah, basically. <laughs> well, exactly. uh, let's have another object stroke word if you've got one. Yes, well, I'm, I'm getting more. This is, I'm going to go out of Greek myth now and just go to uh, my own passions here. I thought I'd go with a, a typewriter. Okay. You know, I mean, you could you could say, well, you know, the letter E as cast in lead by 
Gutenberg in 1450, at the beginning of the print revolution. But the typewriter is an equivalent of moving type, which is what Gutenberg gave the world, of course, and, and, and the printed book arrived, and uh, we never looked back. And uh, the typewriter was a mechanical version that every man could have of a printing press, if you like, so we could mm. all print to some extent. And now we have a slightly updated version in which instead of, instead of a physical key hitting a, a piece of paper, it, we still, by the effort of our own calories hitting the keyboard, mm. we get is. Now, I, I love the, the layout of it, as everyone, mm. I think, probably knows. The, the QWERTY keyboard was not arranged cunningly so that it should reflect the English language at its best and or the French language or any other language, and so therefore you could type most efficiently. It was in order, in order to get the keys that were most used furthest apart from each other so they didn't bash into each Is that other. I didn't know it that. Was in order to make it a convenient really? thing, because if you remember, if you think of the fan-shaped uh, design and layout of an old-fashioned typewriter, these mm. keys have to come forward, and yes, you yes. want the ones you most commonly use to have the shortest journey, I see. but not to bash into each other. So it's so kind of an algorithm for that. It kind somewhere. of is, yeah. You look at which letters come together most commonly. Right. Of course, that's no longer necessary, and people have tried more rational ones. There's one called the Dvorak, a bit like the Czech composer, mm. uh, which is apparently much more, much more intuitive and better and easier to learn, but it's too late. It's too late. You know, we, we yeah. all know the QWERTY. Yeah. I, I like the fact that on the first layer, the first um, row of the QWERTY keyboard, you can type the word typewriter. All from yes. the all those letters are on the top. How self-reflexive is it that? It is, isn't it? It's Do you have pleasing. a favourite typewriter that you use? I mean, obviously you use a computer, but I wonder if you ever have a... I've still uh, got a couple, yes, and I, I do love them as a Hermes one, funnily yeah. enough. Oh, right. talking of Greek. Wow. <laughs> it's a pure coincidence. I, I, had a, I had that lovely sort of stove enamel pistachio green sort of colour Yes, to they're it. so beautiful, I think. Shall we have another audio clip? So let's hear once more from the audiobook of Mythos, and this one, very important for us humans down here talking about the gods above us. This is the bit that Zeus actually decides to create us. This is the moment where, having got a little bit bored with life up there, he thinks, well, I'll have some playthings, and that's us. Suppose, said Zeus, suppose I were to start a new race in the Pythian Games. No, not a running race. A race as in a species. A new order of beings, like us in every particular, upright, on two legs, one head, one head, two hands, resembling us in every particular. Uh, and they would have, uh, you're the intellectual Prometheus, what's the name for that aspect of us that raises us above the animals? Our hands. No, the, the part that tells us that we exist, that makes us aware of ourselves. Consciousness. That's the one. These creatures would have consciousness uh, and language. Uh, they wouldn't be a threat to us, of course. They'd live down here on the land, use their wit to farm and feed and fend for themselves. So, Prometheus frowned in concentration as he tried to form a coherent picture in his mind. A race of beings like us... Exactly, uh, but not as big as us, uh, and they'd be my creation. Well, our creation. Our creation? You're good with your hands, a second Hephaestus. My idea is that you would model these creatures out of... Out of clay, for example. Uh, they should be shaped in our image, anatomically correct in every detail, but on a smaller scale. Then we could animate them give them life, replicate them, and release them into nature to see what happens. Prometheus pondered this idea. Would we engage with them, speak to them, move about with them? That would be exactly the point, to have an intelligent, well, semi-intelligent, species to praise and worship us, to play with us and amuse us, a subservient, adoring race of little miniatures, male and female. It's not him, of course, who really does it. He's basically, what's the word? Project yeah. manages. Yeah, he project manages. That'll do. <laughs> yeah, He's like an artist now, Jeff Koons or whatever. Yes, who or does, Damien, yes, yeah, exactly. Or Damien Hurst. Yeah, they have a workshop. They yeah. have workshops and, and they have the idea, yeah. but it's other Contract people who do it. And it's Hephaestus again who does it, isn't it? Well, no, actually... It's not Hephaestus. No, Hephaestus does, does Pandora later. Oh, OK. But, uh, no, he asked Prometheus. Who oh, he Prometheus says, he it. says, you're a second Hephaestus, you can do it. So he goes and he makes them out of clay. Yes. Makes these little, you know, homunculi, little, little people. 
right. only male because uh, Zeus says no I, I'm enough trouble with with Hera for all the uh, gods I've fathered from other women and I, if I made you you know uh, women as well I'd be in real trouble so it makes these makes these I love that men. Zeus is worried about Hera there's <laughs> yes. a slight George and Mildred element isn't very there, much so to yep. Zeus and Hera <laughs> although George I think if you remember was actually the one who didn't want to have sex which is not true about Zeus but Zeus is hmm. Like a, a, he's a big shagger, yeah. But he's constantly thinking he's under the thumb in yeah. another way of Hera and trying to Absolutely. get away with these it's a, things. It's a classic prototypical relationship, really, because she, she Hera is rather she's imperious, beautiful. I think the word Juno esque, of course, is uh, her Roman name is Juno. Yes, and uh, I think of her as a kind of Aunt Agatha figure to some sometimes. Well, you, you say know? actually, I've, yeah. I've got a quote here from your book, which is crackling with tension, impatience, and distrust. Theirs was nonetheless a great marriage. I'm going to take issue with the word nonetheless. Uh, <laughs> theirs was typically a yes, great marriage, right. I would say, based on my experience. Uh, but uh, but it yeah. is very real, as you mm. say. This is yeah. one of the great things about the gods is they're married and yeah. they're, and it's real. It's full yeah. of flaws and it's got people having sex and trying to get away with it and all that stuff. Absolutely right. When, yeah. do, when do women appear then? I've forgotten now. When when do, when do women well, part of Zeus's, get Zeus's, under the radar? Part of Zeus's fury at uh, Prometheus's theft of fire from, yeah. from Olympus and giving it to man. He, he saves up his punishment of actually chaining Prometheus to the Caucasus Mountains and torturing him. He first gets Hephaestus to create a beautiful woman and all the gods give her various talents and gifts or, or she has all the gifts, which in Greek is Pandora. Mm. And he says to Pandora, here's a jar, which is an interesting little it's side idea. Everyone, everyone thinks it's everyone thinks it's a box, yeah. but that was actually the fault of all people of Erasmus oh, was when it? he was translating it from Greek into Latin. He took the the Greek word for um, for you know Pythios um, for, for jar and thought it was Pixos box. Oh, really? So he called it Pandora. So it's a box sealed Latin, jar, a seal, like an amphora, one of those kind yeah. of olive oil jars. Yeah, yeah, sealed jar. He gives it to Pandora and Hermes conduct to Epimetheus, who is Prometheus's brother. Prometheus is away and has said, "Don't accept any gifts from heaven because he knows Zeus is be trouble. on the war path. He's yeah. going to punish." And uh, this beautiful girl arrives, and Zeus has said to Pandora, by the way, that the jar has got nothing in it, nothing interesting at all, but just so don't look in it ever, yeah, because there's nothing there, <laughs> so don't look. Yeah. And she goes, okay. And yeah. she keeps it in the a bedroom. fabulous she, bit of psychological yeah. double bluffing. She buries it in the garden, she yeah. gets more, and then one night she just can't bear it anymore, and she opens it, and out come this hideous winged creatures who represent starvation and uh, war, pestilence, uh, murder, lies, disputes. Hunger, all, kinds, all that yeah, stuff. All, yeah. the, all the Death. nasty things. Yeah. And then she slams the lid back on, on the jar. And keeping she, in hope, you Keeping say. in Elpis with hope, yes, yeah. yeah. That's how all the horrors of the world came out into the, what was the golden age. It's also how women arrived amongst men. Is it? I didn't know. Yeah, because I, I, I've she married, she'd married Epimetheus. They had a daughter, Pyrrha, who married Deucalion. But women are not one of the terrible things that come out of Pandora's jar. Oh, no, jar, no. Just to <laughs> no, be clear. It's not, no, it's no. The, by no means misogynistic in that. I mean, it might be regarded as being a little similar to the Genesis myth in that it, seemed, it's very it similar seems to, to be myth. women yeah. who were created second and who gave the problems of the world. Absolutely. And also women who are curious yeah. about stuff that gods have said don't bother with yeah. this. For gods so they go is... near this thing. Women can't handle that, apparently. Yeah. And then what what then happens is also very close to Genesis because Epimetheus and Pandora have a daughter, Pyrrha, but Prometheus has a son, Deucalion, and they, they marry and are very happy together, and Prometheus says, you know, the gods are going to punish. He's still not satisfied, Zeus, I can sense it. Mm. So always be prepared. Build yourself a huge wooden chest and sure enough you know Zeus thinks he gets very annoyed by mankind's behaviour this particular thing that makes him really furious but he sends a flood and and Deucalion and, and, and Pyrrha are, are kept afloat on on their on their wooden chest, and, that's um, even geographic and they land thing. yeah, and yeah. they land on a mountain yeah. just as Noah and uh, and his wife and yeah. in other myth land on this. Let's uh, have another object word. Well, this is, this is to do with my um, interest in education and technology. I, I have this hope that AI, which is becoming more and more remarkable, even as we speak, probably in, when we sat down to speak, AI ha had reached mm -hmm. point X. It's now <laughs> it's now reached. Uh, you know, yeah. point why. In fact, we have been replaced by robots <laughs> as we've been talking. Indeed. But one of the, you know, there are all kinds of nightmare scenarios people imagine about, you know, the technological event horizon and, uh, you know, the singularity that will appear um, and, and, you know, will be regarded as a pest by, you know, r r AI driven um, robots and all the rest yeah, of it. But, they will become Zeus. But, but actually, you know, the, the great thing is uh, this kind of technology can can do things we're not very good at, and it's no good at things we are good at and the things we enjoy. So, for example, you know, AI can um, 
can do remarkable things with data and numbers uh, and putting together of things that would take us a very, very long time and which we wouldn't much enjoy, clerical, dull clerical work. Mm. But no amount of AI uh, attached to no amount of robotics can approach the automotive skills and uh, 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 coordination of a one-year-old child mm. uh, or indeed their perceptive skills and, mm. and so on. And, and we wouldn't want that. We don't want to build machines that can walk across the room for us mm. or can, you know, make love for us we mm. you know might have a sex robot of course mm. but yeah but um one of the things we're very bad at is educating children we set them at pathetic ex exams that oh, yeah. exams that, that seem to be there to find out what they don't know and, mm. and make them nervous and if you imagined a, a sort of perfect teacher i've chosen my object the coffee cup so you know the perfect teacher would just say to a child oh, here's a coffee cup tell me what you well, can about it. Now, the child can may know something about pottery and just talk about how the, the Chinese were the ones who had this kind of strange stuff that we call porcelain and we call it China now because it came from there and how they, they might just talk about that or they might talk about Starbucks. They might, talk, they might know something about how Starbucks started. They might know that Starbucks was the name of the coffee-loving first mate on the Pequod in, in uh, Moby Dick. You know. But the point is they would chase the path of knowledge in all the directions. They might know something about cash crops and they might have a political sense about mm. the, you know, the sort of imperialist colonisation of much of the developing world into this cash crop coffee and, and what it's done to them. And, and they might talk about the fair trade movement and how it's improving and things like that. They, they might talk about the chemistry of what kind of a beverage coffee is it. Is it emulsified? Is it, is it a solution? You know, it has a very specific yeah. quality, the brewing of it and yeah. how it's done and uh, the heat required. And so they might on. also... They so might need not talk about any facts at all. They might, they might just spin imaginative they might ideas tell, exactly. from seeing a cup. Or if they're interested in history, they might talk about the development of coffee houses in the 17th mm. century, which Charles II yeah. closed down because they were places, hotbeds of sedition. But then the other coffee houses of Vienna, say, in the time of the Great Secession with Mahler and Klimt and mm. Schoenberg and, mm. uh, you know, all these, you know, Zweig and all these amazing intellectuals and people coming together and how coffee therefore has been a sort of strange kind of uh, facilitator of, uh, of, of movements of, of thought and so on. There's so many things they can discuss and be encouraged by by an intelligent system, which which is there precisely to guide them through what they know. There aren't enough teachers who are that good, who who have that range of knowledge themselves, mm. to be able to get that out of the child. Mm. And, and they also, it's not about testing them exactly. It's about structuring a kind mm. of a kind of world that the child enters in which they can show, they can show off, they can, mm. they can ex exhibit enthusiasm about uh, the directions they go. Do you think that it would actually be something that would replace uh, education, that, that you could use uh, very, very informed robots to replace teachers? Uh, no disrespect to any teachers listening or any members of the National Union of Teachers, but is, <laughs> do you actually think that would be a way forward? Well, yes, I do. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, that of course, human will and, uh, and control has got to be, you know, to shape it. Uh, but uh, in the same way that uh, when people were educated in, uh, in the 14th century, if the very small number of people who were, they were treated, they were educated by priests and, mm. and they were occasionally shown manuscripts. Mm. But once the printed book had, had, had achieved primacy, um, a, a kind of... Uh, a kind of AI system, a very stable and fixed one, but, but mm. to which was added all the time, was a library. Right. And children were taught how to use libraries, how to move in amongst different great fields of data and great streams of information and historical narrative and, and you know, mathematics and all kinds of things. But And libraries are still quite forbidding places to many children because we, and people like you and me who are lucky enough to go, you know, to go to universities where and we probably had fairly friendly relationships with libraries from an early age. We mm. probably found them sexy sexy, exciting, mm. remarkable places. Mm. But a lot of children found them, oh, God, you know, they associated them with that whole oh, I'm not academic sort of thing that uh, is such a stumbling block for so many of the young. And and uh, so they, they would be the, like living libraries, like the Borgesian library, but, you know, they've been absolutely alive and, and sort of totally three, four-dimensional um, in, in, in which... Uh, and and because the, the important thing is... Educare is, you know, again, <laughs> be classical about it, is the Latin for to draw out. It's not to put it in. Is. It's not to put in. Right. You don't educate people by putting things in. Oh, you draw out. Educare, yeah.
So let's have a final extract from Mythos. And actually, this is the bit uh, that we've already talked about, but which is so important for humanity that has led us to this pretty pass when Pandora lets her curiosity overcome her and she opens that jar, not box. Unable to stand it any longer, Pandora leapt down from her matrimonial bed and was out in the garden, unrolling the base of the sundial and scrabbling at the earth before she had time to tell herself that this was the wrong thing to do. She pulled the jar from its hiding place and twisted at the lid. Its waxen seal gave way and she pulled it free. There was a fast fluttering, a furious flapping of wings, and a wild wheeling and whirling in her ears. Oh, glorious flying creatures! But no, they were not glorious at all. Pandora cried out in pain and fright as she felt something leathery brush her neck, followed by a sharp and terrible prick of pain as some sting or bite pierced her skin. More and more flying shapes buzzed from the mouth of the jar, a great cloud of them chattering, screaming and howling in her ears. Through the swirling fog of these dreadful creatures, she saw the face of her husband as he came outside to see what was happening. It was white with horror and fright. With a great cry, Pandora summoned up the courage and strength to close the lid and seal the jar. On the garden wall, in the shape of a wolf, Zeus looked on, smiling the most terrible and wicked smile, as, like a cloud of locusts, the shrieking, wailing creatures clawed the air and circled the garden below them in a great vortex before flying up and away over the town, over the countryside, and around the world, settling like a pestilence wherever man had habitation. I think you've got one more object to share with me. Yes, well, it's Revolver. Um, oh, good. Like most British people, I think, pretty terrified and very unfamiliar with of, of firearms and don't like them. And they, of course, are pretty symbolic or totemic in, in our world and they express something um, about people who own them and violence is a terrible thing. And, of course, the invention of the, of the gun in one form or another was the first time we could really remotely kill people with quite that, uh, you know, there was the bow and arrow, but this was a, a step change, shall we say. But what was interesting is it's just I, I'm so interested in how technology is, has no valency, it, it's agnostic, you know, and the very thing that allowed guns to be made was that you were forced to have repeatable components, that a component had to be absolutely precise, but the screw that held in that bit of the breech on that make of gun could be used on another gun. Mm. So that when the gun got a bit loose, you'd, you, in other words, you would have spare parts. Mm -hmm. And that had never happened before. You'd made things and you made a cart and it was, it was custom made. It was unique to itself. And if you wanted to improve it, you just made a new bit for it. But I suddenly you had to have an really? army that all had muskets and there was a lock on the musket. So guns are the lock. first object to Pretty be, much, as yeah. it were, mass produced or at least produced in a repeatable way. Exactly. So you had to have a kind of precision making of components. Really? Which was the basis of everything that came, you know, and of course we're familiar with Ford and the much more sophisticated nature of his conveyor belts and so on, but it really was gun making that, that, that did it. And it was, the, it was the need of the Navy and various other uh, armed forces. It was a very malevolent sort of need in some ways because it was about control mm. and power and winning wars and, and killing sub people, subduing native yeah. populations and yeah. all the rest of it. But it was also a very beautiful and extraordinary invention. Is it the first time, therefore, that you get models, as in this is the... Uh, whatever it might be, this is a this is named as a particular yes. object. I can't think of any names of guns now because I don't know much about well, guns. The but Colt forty five, Colt forty five. Yes, this is the Colt. What's the one that James Bond has? Uh, Smith and Wesson, and then a Beretta as well. Right. He had, but yeah. They, is yeah. That, so is that the first time that happens? Then the objects are identified are as it were named in, a, go, in a godly way, really. That, that, that we give. Yeah. 
the uh, an inanimate thing, an identity, through naming it. I think that is pretty much true. I mean, of course, some people would immediately say, well, well what about the clock? And, of course, it's true that, uh, that clocks were made, and but they tended to be individually made, and you wouldn't necessarily be able to take the nut from one. I don't think they made, like, a thousand little nuts and then say, oh, right, I'm going to make a new clock, and, oh, I've already got the nut. You know, each one was a new design. So mm. you look at the great sort of Harrington people like that and their fabulous, uh, fabulous, you know, the grasshopper escapement or whatever was unique for that particular uh, clock. But guns, uh, you had to be able to give, you know, one soldier, you know, and then another and uh, and replace the parts. Mm. So, um, And with it will come bullets, presumably. Bullets would have to therefore be made in a specific way to fit, to fit specific of, guns. Exactly. Once once you've got that, once... It, I mean, the, the original musketry, of course, you, you were making little, uh, your own charge mm. yourself. Um, but uh, it then... That's why I chose the revolver rather than just gunfire itself. But do you think, therefore... That that this idea of repeatability, of creating something which you can then manufacture to be the same mm. again, that, that when that happens with the role, that creates essentially the industrial age. I think it does. It's one of the absolute parts of it that is unmistakably necessary. Um, no longer are things custom made for that, you know, you start to... So even way before Ford, you know, the, uh, the thousands of miles of railway track that were being laid uh, by the different railway companies, these were being made the same Mm. The same things, moulds and and things were getting more precise all the time, so that things could fit into each other. Were made in different factories, even as long as the specifications were right. Yeah. And this is where measurement and things became so absolutely vital. There's an obvious irony in the fact that it's a gun; it's the thing that that That's destroys, exactly. uh, that would create this sort of extraordinary plenitude at some level industrially. The things that we, we would go on to machine and manufacture, and yet it begins well, with something that is about destruction. The two gods, Eros and maybe. Thanatos rather than Ares, the god of war, if you look at technology. I mean, I, I remember saying as a sort of joke when the World Wide Web started to develop in the early 90s, I said, well, this is going to... This is going to be the death knell for uh, sex lines because if you remember in the eighties, mm. oh, every, every night, yes, yeah. exactly, not every, every night. <laughs> but no, every every night was advertised on late yes. night television. Would yes. be these different sex lines. I mean, it was just a huge industry, extraordinarily yeah. quaint now and, and rather exactly. charming. But I remember you would thinking, do that. yeah. And then when the when the mobile phone uh, became the smartphone, I remember thinking, well, this is going to change. Sex is going to drive. Is it sex sex tends normally. to drive. And it's the same with robotics. Who, which of us hasn't thought there is the possibility of the most ideal and fabulous mm. sex slave yes. do anything. Well, it's happening. As well. I, is. I've seen various exactly. programmes showing not generally ideal or no. they, they tend to look a bit weird <laughs> and like mannequins that have had a bit of a harsh beating somewhere. <laughs> but the idea is somewhere, yeah. Yeah. somewhere in Ex Machina, in fact, and yeah. those kind of films, is yes. this idea of an extraordinary sexual partner that you can design like for your Scarlet own. Scarlet Johansson. Yeah, exactly. Yes. That's, that, yeah. that's obviously something I think as about a lot. they don't but, drown you in black goo. Like. Well, well that, that's very Greek, isn't it? Yes. So to come back to Greek myth is that normally any kind of deep human fantasy which we would all project mm. God or yeah. gods will have a backwash won't it we'll always imagine something right. going wrong with it and that is where narrative begins doesn't it yeah. narrative always begins with obstacles with desire mm. thwarted mm. and the Greeks perhaps yeah, yeah. show that more than well certainly one of the first first cultures to really demonstrate that indeed and indeed what we were talking about earlier is a, is a perfect example of what the Greeks understood that it seems for every advance we make for every every development every achievement there is an equal and opposite drawback or a, a, a terrible outcome or backwash as you rather well, what what I'm going to ask you a banal question to, to, to begin oh, the, the wind up the banal question is which Greek god would you like to be if you could have been oh, a Greek god yourself? No question. Hermes. Hermes. Hermes, yes. He's in mischief, roguery, uh, storytelling, lying, cheating, uh, but but a kind of... I mean, I wish I had his, his kind of pert speed and charm as a physical object he's as well mercury, as his mind. He? He's, mercury. he's Mercury to the Romans, exactly. Yeah. I see. Um, so I, I, he's the one I, I, I would... I just... I think I'd most like to meet... Um, of course, like all the gods, could be um, um, nasty and cruel and murderous. Yeah. The way he kills Argus, the the, the hundred eye guardian of, of Io, is is very very cruel. And um, but he nothing happens to him. Does he? he doesn't end up uh, strapped to a rock or anything? No, Does no, he, he doesn't fall out with Zeus and have to eat his own leg forever no. or anything like that. <laughs> Amazingly, he doesn't. <laughs> right. Well, that's good. Yeah, he yeah. survives in the uh, in the Dodecatheon, as uh, as it's grandly called, the 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 pantheon of twelve gods. The Olympian gods are twelve. Uh, in terms of, you know, the fact that I completely agree with you that this is a book which is incredibly accessible and which children could read and, and all the rest of it, 
anyone listening to this, what would you say to them in terms of, you know, you may not have thought of the Greek gods as something you want to read about, but what is it What is it that actually finds the way in for someone who's never really thought I, about them? I'd say it's a bit like falling in love in as much as you... If you don't know them, there's nothing you have to know to come to start reading them. It starts with an empty universe, there's, you know, and, and it, the creation that happens and you watch the characters arriving. But you will feel, as I say, like falling in love, that you, I know this, I, you know, that thing, yes. in, you know, the four quartets, you know, I've, I know this place for the, for the first time and yet I've been here before kind of feeling, you know, there's something so familiar. And that's because it's embedded deep in our cultural DNA so strongly. And without noticing it, we have seen, you know, whether it's the Statue of Eros or whether it's in our language and we talk about things being hermetically sealed or our Achilles heel or whatever it is, you know, it's 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 with us. It's almost as if it's like a little parallel world that's been there whispering in our ears all this time. And finally to confront it and to feel familiar with it and friends with the characters in it, I think is a great feeling. I completely agree. And I think we should end it there. Hurrah. What's the Greek for goodbye? <laughs> um, yasum, I think. Yasus, yasum. Yasus. New from Penguin Random House Audio, A Legacy of Spies by John le Carré, read by Tom Hollander. The first novel in over 25 years to feature George Smiley, le Carré's most beloved character. Smiley didn't say much at my debriefing, just sat and listened and occasionally peered owlishly at me through his thick-rimmed spectacles. But when it was over, he suggested we take a turn in the garden, which seemed endless and had a park attached to it. We talked. We sat on a bench, strolled, sat again, kept talking. My dear mother, was she alive and well? She's fine, thank you, George. A bit dotty, but fine. Then my father, had I kept his medals? I said that my mother polished them every Sunday, which was true. I didn't mention that she sometimes hung them on me and wept. But unlike Jack, he never asked me about my girls. He must have thought there was safety in numbers. And when I recall that conversation now, I can't help thinking that, consciously or not, he was offering himself as the father figure he later became. But perhaps the feeling was in me and not in him. The fact remains that when he finally popped the question, I had a feeling of coming home, even though my home was across the channel in Brittany. We were wondering, you see, he said in a faraway voice, whether you'd ever considered signing up with us on a more regular basis. People who have worked on the outside for us don't always fit well on the inside. But in your case, we think you might. We don't pay a lot, and careers tend to be interrupted, but we do feel it's an important job, as long as one cares about the end, and not too much about the means. Interweaving past with present so that each may tell its own intense story, John le Carré has spun a single plot as ingenious and thrilling as the two predecessors on which it looks back. The Spy Who Came In From The Cold and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Available now to download and own from Audible, iTunes and Kobo.